Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Hager, and I'm pleased to present a short history of Woodstock. Why me? Well, as a news reporter, I've always been fascinated by history. And as somebody who grew up here, I went to Woodstock High School in the 1950s, I've been especially interested in Woodstock history. But the real experts are, of course, the people at the Woodstock History Center. I'd like to acknowledge their help with information and a lot of their old photos in this presentation. And speaking of the photos, uh, please, some are protected by copyright, so no reuse of the images here on this broadcast without permission from the Woodstock History Center, please. Otherwise, please join me now for a journey back through the years, the history of our unique town. Woodstock was still wilderness when the King of England first chartered the land and named it Woodstock back in 1761. The first inhabitant didn't arrive until four years later. A stone marker across from the Woodstock Sports Center marks the spot where he built his cabin. He was a young Harvard student named Timothy Knox. His girlfriend had jilted him, so he came here to live alone. But within three years, others followed, lured by the water power of the Ottaquiche River. And a few years after that, Woodstock was declared the Shire Town, or county seat of Windsor County. That led to a courthouse and a county jail, which happens to be the house where my wife and I live today, right across Route 4 from Town Hall. Happily, our house no longer looks like a jail, but it was for the first decade of existence. This isn't the original sign, but one that I made. Notice the jailer hedged his bets by renting rooms on the side. And once the jail moved elsewhere, our house became a tavern, Birch's Tavern. About that time, still in the 1700s, land was given for Woodstock's commons, or town green. Interesting story. When I was a schoolboy, we were all told that our green had been laid out in the dimensions of a famous warship. The ship was the Olympia and it had won an important battle in the Spanish-American War under the command of a famous Vermonter, Admiral George Dewey. But there's a little problem with that story. The ship wasn't even built until a hundred years after our green had been laid out. And the ship would have been gigantic if it was really the size of our green. In fact, it was only about half as big. Whoops! Our local history center assures me there was no connection between our green and the ship Olympia. In any event, the green has always been the centerpiece of our town. The county fair began life on the green before it moved elsewhere. When I was a kid, there was a skating rink on the green. And of course, today in the summertime, it's home to the weekly farmer's market. On the darker side, the green was the scene of a public hanging back in 1818. A prisoner was convicted of murder. This is an illustration purporting to be of the actual event. Thousands came to watch. And in the 1830s, legend has it the heart of a vampire was buried on the green. The heart of a local youth who had died of consumption and whom people later decided must have been a vampire. But in reality, the story didn't even emerge until it was published in a short newspaper account 55 years after it was supposed to have happened. And even that was only based on some third-hand account. So once again, oops, the History Center assures me there's no evidence that the heart of a vampire or anyone's heart was ever buried on the green. Otherwise, in the 1800s in Vermont, the years were dominated by sheep farming. Here you see a flock grazing on Mount Tom, deforested, not woodland as it is today. This in turn led to construction of big woolen mills up and down the Ottaquiche River. In Woodstock, there was the Solomon Woodward Mill, where the Woodstock Recreation Center is today. In Queechy, there was the Parker Mill, which later became the Dewey Mill. And in Bridgewater, the Bridgewater Mill, which was built in 1828 and was still a major employer when I was a kid here in the 1950s. I remember you could tell what color dye the mill was running by the color of the Ottaquiche as it ran through town downriver here in Woodstock. 
But by the later 1900s, the textile industry moved to the southern U.S., where non-union labor was cheaper, and most of the Vermont mills closed. What's left of the Queechee Mill became Simon Pierce Restaurant and glass blowing. Bridgewater Mill is now Shackleton Furniture, Ramonto's Pizza, and the Bridgewater Mall. Well, next, the backstory of Woodstock's iconic Middle Bridge. When I was a kid, it wasn't a covered bridge. It was this iron bridge. This is the middle bridge that I grew up with. But about 50 years ago, when it needed replacement, the town decided to make it a traditional covered bridge and hired a man from New Hampshire named Milton Grayton, who was known as the last of the covered bridge builders. Grayton and his son built the bridge completely out of wood, even used wooden pegs instead of nails. To be authentic, they had it hauled into place using oxen. It got nationwide attention when Life magazine did a full-page spread. But within five years, a couple of local kids set fire to it, nearly burning it down. You can see here how extensive the damage was. To Woodstock's credit, the town brought the same bridge builders back to fix it. And today, it's probably one of the most photographed sites in the whole state of Vermont. But to turn to the real fundamentals of Woodstock history, what I think makes the town what it is today, as I mentioned earlier, I believe it's two things, the inn and the railroad. There's always been an inn here on roughly the same site, but under different names and as different buildings. The first was Richardson's Tavern, already in business back in the late 1700s. Later, a front porch was added, and it was renamed the Eagle Hotel. See the eagle there atop the pole at the corner? That eagle was carved out of wood by a local cabinet maker way back in 1830. I'll come back to that in a few moments. Meantime, in 1875, the Woodstock Railroad opened, running between Woodstock and White River Junction, which in turn had trains connecting to Boston and New York. The railroad was an ambitious undertaking, mostly because it had to span the Queechee Gorge, 150 feet deep. This is a photo of the first trial locomotive being sent across to test the construction. Imagine being the engineer of that train. Thankfully, he made it. And the railroad was prosperous, bringing folks to and from the cities as vacationers or summer-long residents. They unloaded at the Woodstock station and were met by carriages headed for downtown and for the inn. The lure was the outdoors and a rural landscape. In the summer, picnicking and hiking, bicycling, playing golf. In the winter, ice skating and frolicking in the snow. A ski jump was built where the golf course is now. Of course, any self-respecting getaway location had to have a spa in those days, so Woodstock sort of manufactured one by building a rudimentary shelter around a freshwater spring. All of this is what some call our own gilded age here in Woodstock. It was the same sort of lure that had drawn city people to the rural surroundings of the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York and had led to the construction of the big camps there. In Woodstock, Folks came with big trunks to stay for a month or the whole summer. Some bought the gracious houses that line the green. Then and now, those homes have mostly been owned by out-of-state part-timers. Alas, the railroad finally folded, but only after a nearly 60-year run. It closed in 1933 during the Great Depression. VIPs were invited on the last ceremonial run to White River, but the occasion was spoiled when some youngsters greased the rails on one of the hills and the locomotive couldn't make it up. One of the two VIP coaches had to be uncoupled and left behind out there in the middle of nowhere. Meantime, what was the Woodstock Station still exists, of course, although presently dormant, in Woodstock's East End. Out back, there's still today what's left of the circular pit of the turntable that used to turn the locomotives around to head back to White River. And I have today in my own study 
the station master's desk from what was the Taftsville station, one of many along the line. My father rescued it, and I took it with me to my office at the NBC News Bureau in Washington, D.C., before I brought it back here when I retired. In fact, it's where I prepared this presentation. Okay, back to the inn. I left off when it was still the Eagle Hotel, right after the railroad opened. But in 1892, this is how it was rebuilt and renamed for the first time the Woodstock Inn. With a different coat of paint, this is the same inn that I grew up with in the 1950s. I remember it fondly. It sat on the same site, but adjacent to the green, right up close to the street, close to Route 4. Then enter our town's great benefactor, Lawrence Rockefeller. He'd married a local woman, Mary Billings French, and he'd already begun rock resorts, buying up vacation properties in the Caribbean and elsewhere. So now he bought the Woodstock Inn, the Woodstock Country Club, two ski areas, and several of the old homes in Woodstock, all in the interest of preservation. Alas, Rock Resorts deemed the old inn an aging fire trap and decided to tear it down. But only after staging a final big dance and inviting the whole town. I was long gone from Woodstock at that point, but I remember my parents went to that dance. Meantime, the new inn, today's inn, was built somewhat set back from the street so the old inn could stay open until the new one was ready. It's been remodeled a few times since, but it maintains the same general gracious character. One side story about the inn, really about the beautiful brick federal-style house next door where John and Wendy Spector now live. Originally, Rock Resorts bought it as well as the inn and planned to turn it into their VIP suite at the inn, the so-called governor's suite. Except the town turned the plan down ruled it a zoning violation. Imagine turning down Lawrence Rockefeller, who'd bought up half of Woodstock to preserve its character, and who'd even paid personally to bury all the electric lines in town. Anyhow, when the inn was told it couldn't use it as a VIP suite, Rock Resorts sold it. A couple of other historic points to make about Woodstock. There is, of course, the first motor-powered ski tow in America. It opened in 1934 on Gilbert's Hill, just north of town, and this is the Model T engine that powered it. Two years later, on the other side of that hill, hill number six, Suicide Six began operations. Bunny Bertram, who was still alive when I was a kid, so I knew him, Bunny Bertram founded it, and it was called Suicide Six because that was the fashion of the day, to give ski hills a scary or daring name. Well, later, after Rockefeller bought Suicide Six and the resort wanted to appeal to families, it changed the name from Suicide Six to just plain Six. That first effort to drop the suicide was a complete failure. Everyone in town still called it Suicide Six, and the inn had to give up the name change. That is, until just last winter, when Rock Resorts deemed it Saskadena Six. This time, it looks like the name change is going to stick. One other bit of history I'd like to touch on is the little-known presence of a thriving black community just along South Street in the area of the present elementary school and the golf course. It developed before the Civil War, so its residents were free blacks. And by the time of the war, it was home to 56 people, 11 of them enlisted in the Union Army, joining that 54th Regiment, that famous regiment for blacks, which was organized out of Massachusetts. Woodstock's black community petered out over succeeding decades. When I was a kid, there was just one of the families left, a man named Tommy Hazard, who was much loved in town. He was a town scoutmaster and a leader of the Woodstock Episcopal Church. Finally, a word about Frederick Billings, arguably our town's most famous resident. When he first moved here, he lived a modest existence, even raised pigs. But he managed to get himself to law school and then got intrigued by the California gold rush. He sailed by clipper ship down to Panama. This was way before the canal, so he had to cross Panama by mule train 
and then take another clipper ship to San Francisco. An arduous journey, and it took forever. But once in San Francisco, he made a fortune doing legal work around mining claims. And after returning east to New York and to Woodstock, Billings became president of the Northern Pacific Railroad, and Billings, Montana is named for him. By the way, just a short while ago, my wife and I played the roles of Frederick Billings and his wife in a history pageant here. But unfortunately, the role didn't come with the Billings money. Finally, I'd like to note that some things are constant. That eagle, carved way back in 1830, is still faithfully replicated atop the front door of the Woodstock Inn. There it is today. And the real one, the original wooden eagle, carved way back in 1830, is displayed in a case in the main dining room of the inn, and like the town, it's still in pristine shape. A town that's still picturesque and special, thanks in part to the legacy of the Inn and the Woodstock Railroad. Well, I hope you enjoyed this, and I'd like to leave you with a couple of observations about our whole state of Vermont. When I was raised here in the 1950s, it was one, rural. It was two, somewhat poor, at least compared with much of the nation. And three, it was solidly Republican, moderate Republican, but Republican. Well, today it's the opposite on all three counts. Increasingly, it's not rural. Sadly, one by one, our dairy farms are disappearing. Certainly, it's not poor. And arguably, on the political front, it's one of the most liberal Democrat states in the Union. So what happened? Well, outsiders discovered Vermont, moved here in droves. The interstate highway system promoted some of that, as so did the invasion of hippies in the late 1960s and early 70s. But through it all, Woodstock has always been a unique town. And the central point of this presentation that I'd like to leave you with is that the groundwork for it was Woodstock's what I call Gilded Age, promoted by the Inn and the Woodstock Railroad. I'm Bob Hager. Thanks a lot for watching.